So, um, thanks to them. Uh, I'm with Crowd Supply, um, with Daryl and Hannah. Uh, we're gonna, you, you can find out more about Crowd Supply on our website, of course, but um, just wanted to talk real quickly about user rights and what that means to us. Uh, it's something we think about a lot. So, uh, my background is uh, academic, a large part of it. Uh, I did a lot of Internet of Things things before it was called the Internet of Things. We called it Distributed Mesh Sensor Networks. That's my hand, my youthful graduate student hand. Uh, modeling for this about 100 node uh, network that I set up and, and built and purely these things talking to each other and figuring out how to program them and what kind of network protocols to use. Uh, no application whatsoever. My, um, my, thought, my thought process around that evolved a little bit and I decided, okay, I want to make something that is useful. So we made these uh, uh, power strips that could actually be used around the building, um, but they could sense everything that was happening to them, right? And they had some means of outputting like speakers. They had a really fine current sensing on each of those four outlets that had a light sensor, uh, accelerometer, uh, motion detector, all these things. So we're gathering all that data, gathering real world usage. And even though it was in the real world, it was still something, uh, something wasn't quite right in, in my mind about this. And um, I, I decided that, that actually the Internet of Things was going to be impossible, the way that everyone was thinking about it, without this foundation of uh, it being, them being open source so that they could all play together. Right? And without crowdfunding, right? so that it wasn't just one large player or a number of large players making these devices, but actually many different people making many different devices that could all talk to each other. And that's kind of the dream of the Internet of Things. Otherwise, it's just a connected device, and that's, that's very different. So this foundation is, is something that's core to crowd supply. Here's an example of an Internet of Thing. Uh, this is the Plan SDR, just recently funded, uh, north of $600,000 totally open source, um, and uh, it ranges from, I think it's 300, kilo, 300 kilohertz? About right. Maybe, maybe 100 kilohertz up to 3.8 uh, gigahertz. Um, software defined radio. So it lets you connect almost everything. Uh, you can make your own cell towers, your own um, you know, uh, LTE towers, connected to your Bluetooth devices, connected to your own custom Zigbee protocol or whatever. Um, Okay, so Internet of Things, that's one thing we're interested in that's impossible about this product funding and open source foundation. Tools like this, like Arduino, uh, have a massive ecosystem, um, and that's their value, right? The value wasn't in the week or so it took somebody to design it, because it's really just an 8-bit microcontroller uh, and, and the, the surrounding uh, pieces to make it work. Um, that part was easy. It was not a complex tool like this, right? This is uh, what's this is trying to be the Arduino of FPGAs. Right? This was found, funded on Crowd Supply um, by a team of three guys who spent you know, a couple of years working on it. I mean, there's there's several engineering uh, people years in there, um, and it was not simple to create. Right? This is something that typically you wouldn't see outside of. The National, uh, the Naval Research Lab, or uh, NASA, or some large corporation, and those folks don't have the incentive to create these complex tools and, and give them out to people. Right? So they're not complex tools unless somebody's using them. They can be complex things that can be productized and and safeguard it. Um, but these complex tools also require this foundation of open source and, and crowdfunding. Uh, that's the, the second sort of thing we're interested in in the crowd supply. When you look at this picture of either peaches or nectarines, or maybe it's plastic, you can't really tell, right? Uh, uh, you, you don't have the context of, of what this is right now. If you saw this in a grocery store, um, you have all these cues that you can pick up on, and you'd know that it was biodynamic and organic and uh, fair trade, for example, right? And all of these marketing terms have meaning, and there are certifications that go along with that. Um, and so as a consumer, you can very quickly assess the, the value uh, proposition that, that the company that's selling you this thing um, has put forth. Uh, the same is not true of something like this. So this is actually this laptop, right? Uh, or that model. Um, and 
similarly, in a vacuum, you don't know how this was made. You don't know uh, what kind of software it's running, um, where it was made, uh, what, what the company behind it as the motivations are. But even you don't even know that if you buy it in a store with all of the, the signage, right? We're several decades behind in the consumer electronics space um, compared to the, the food space. Uh, and an important example um, of this was just last summer when Lenovo got caught with the Superfish debacle, uh, which was some spyware they were essentially put on their machines purposefully to, to track user actions and then sell that to uh, an app partner. Um, this was without the, the notification of users. They were really caught doing this. And they were supposed to be the good guys. They are supposed to be selling you something that, that fights for you. So those, those uh, products that fight for the user are the last category that we believe um, require this, this foundation of open source and crowdfunding. Uh, and this is the category I want to talk about uh, briefly now. Right? Like, what does this mean to fight for the user? Um, there are certain rights that we think that users should have, and uh, this is similar to like an open source license, but it's not supposed to be. This is in in, in prose essentially, right? Um, and it's about the whole product. It's not just about the software. It's not just about the the design or anything like that. So first, right, curiosity. I should be able to explore and look at and and take apart and reverse engineer my products that I bought, that I ostensibly own. Um, the flip side of this, right, is that... Uh, it's DCMA. <coughs> the flip side is DCMA. DCMA. Yeah. 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 The Digital Copyright Money Act. DCMA, yes. Um, and so as a creator making a product that, that abides by this sort of rule set, I am essentially promising that I'm not going to sue you under certain provisions of the DCMA. Um, and that, of course, is going to court now. Uh, just recently, Bunny Wong uh, sued the U.S. government for that. Second right is independence. Um, I shouldn't need to be connected to the producer of the product beyond just giving them money. Right? I shouldn't have to be required to have a subscription or uh, any other connection to the creator. Right? I own it outright. I can go and do what I want with it after that. If it, if I required to do um, to subscribe, to have utility, then, then I haven't really bought a product. Longevity is, is something uh, that hit the news recently when um, the Google's parent company bought a, uh, another company called uh, Revolve, I believe it was, um, and they decided to shut down their product line, right? And, and the product was a, was a Internet of Things hub, like a home automation hub. Um, and they could have just turned the service off and be, had, that, that could have been it. But instead, they actually bricked all the devices that people had bought. Right? They got some bad press for this, obviously. Uh, and it's OK to shut down your service. That's one thing. But to actually make useless a product that I own without my permission is a totally different proposition. So longevity, the, the, the natural lifetime of product is really that was, that was similar to the FTDI thing, when FTDI yes. had a Counterfeit devices, and they changed their drivers so that anybody had a counterfeit device would get bricked. Yeah. So people who bought devices not knowing that had their devices bricked. Yeah. Well, yeah. So ownership, um, it, it's a pretty simple one. I, I can go resell this thing. I'm not leasing it. I'm not uh, under any any covenant or lien uh, after I've bought the product so that limits my my uh, how how I use it or who I give it to. Um, I should be able to talk freely about this product, uh, whether it's uh, in a positive light or a negative light, whether it's comparing against benchmarks that maybe aren't favorable to the, to the, uh, the producer. Um, that should prohibit my discourse. I should be able to associate my products with other products that, that may or may not be made by the same uh, company. And this is kind of breaking down the walled garden concept, right? Where, um, OK, my, my lightning connector, uh, forcing me to only use Apple products, for example. Um, but I should be able to freely use, use products that I own with, with whatever products I wish. <coughs> and then finally, we have uh, privacy and security. Right? I need to know what's being collected about me, because more, because more and more, the value of a product is not the money that, that I pay for it, but actually the information that it's gathering right? and sending back um, to whoever. 
Uh, yes, exactly, Nest, right. Uh, Google, uh, whoever. Um, and the, yeah, the flip side of that is sort of security, or a, a close cousin, I should say, is security. Uh, when these things go wrong, it can go really horribly wrong. And um, it, it, as, a, as a user, as an owner of a product, I expect that I will be informed in a timely manner of, of these holes and uh, with enough time to fix them. Now, of course, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity with all of these things, right? But that's the, the general set of eight principles that we've thought a lot about We've analyzed a lot of different products, and we've kind of boiled it down to these eight things that we'd like to see all products uh, abide by, and all creators um, uh, stand behind. Um, this is something that we'll be announcing more broadly and, and more publicly beyond just talks like this, and actually have on the website soon. Um, and it really applies to every sort of product. Uh, of course, we are specializing in hardware, um, we, we mostly, 99% you know, of what we do is hardware, the other 1% is software associated with some sort of hardware. Um, and the, the notion of open source is, is intimately connected with these rights, right? The notion of openness is, uh, kind of conveys these, these rights in, in, in some ways. Uh, but what exactly does open source mean when it comes to hardware? Um, for software, it's fairly well defined. You have a license and uh, you abide by that license and it's source code, that's it. Uh, hardware can have all sorts of different things, right? Of course, there's software pieces, like the firmware on the device, the, the, the device software um, uh, itself, if it's running a, an embedded operating system, for example. Uh, if I connect it to USB and use software on the host machine, that's another piece. And then, of course, there's cloud services and, and, and software like that. So all of that falls under the, the, the model of open source software pretty well. Uh, then there are things like schematics and layout, right? But even that gets more fine grained right? I can have Gerber files, but that's very different than the actual uh, source schematic, right? Or source layout, rather. Um, one of them's editable, the other is not so easy to get. Similarly with schematics, I give you a PDF, but, or do I give you the ORCAD drawings, or the you know, KiCad, or whatever it is. Um, uh, or maybe I give you the schematics without the layout. For example, in that 12-layer FPGA board I showed you, the Snickerdoodle, that's what they're doing. Layout is really the, the hard part, right? It's like every millimeter counts. Uh, but the schematics, they want people to know how it works. <clears throat> and of course, there's the data and how to access that data. And most things, or many things, collect data these days. And, and is that walled off? Where do I have access to it? If so, how? Uh, you know, there's the famous um, fight between Google and Oracle about uh, the API, right? And so the court recently decided that APIs are not copyrightable, just the right decision. Um, then there are things like documentation which we take for granted in, in software because the software is almost a documentation. We can generate documentation from software in many cases. The documentation of hardware is very different, right? For, for example, uh, every single modern laptop, um, you have to sign an NDA to find out exactly how it works, right? And usually multiple NDAs, some for the video driver, some for the processor, uh, any sort of highly specialized um, ASIC or IC uh, requires an NDA, um, with, with few exceptions. Um, the tool chain is, is another piece, right? Imagine having, you know, we have compilers, we have GCC for software, and we just take it for granted. It's like, oh, GCC, of course, it's, it's open source, and so I can compile any sort of C code for this processor. The same is not true of hardware. You know, and there are compilers for hardware, as there are for software, for example, FPGAs. There really is not a free or open source uh, option for the tool set. You can make the, the results free and open source, but to actually compile it down, you, you need to, to pay into a proprietary um, tool. And the paying in part isn't the problem, right? because if you're selling hardware, you have money. The problem is trusting that software to do the thing that it's saying it's, it's doing. Uh, and then finally, the, the supply chain, right? Uh, in the end, when you make a hardware product and you're selling it, um, all the innovation is, has been done at that point. When, they, when people have it, the innovation, the engineering, is largely done. You're working on your next product. The real value you have, then, is the supply chain. How do you make this thing? Right? Who do I get the parts from? Who's actually putting it together? And that's a very closely held secret uh, by many companies. Um, so I'm going to go over some projects that we've seen at CrowdSupply that have come through us and, and gotten funded and shipped. 
or, or in the process of being shipped, uh, and just how they exemplify some of these different things. So this is the ultimate hack and keyboard. It's a project out of Hungary, um, and uh, really solid, nice lap, uh, keyboard. I think Darl uses one of the master prototypes as his keyboard right now. We have, we're lucky enough to have him in the office. Um, completely open source. Everything's uh, released under GPL3, I think, or maybe two, I forget. Uh, but they didn't release everything until after they got it funded, right? Because they wanted to hold on to everything until they were sure they had raised enough money to go build it. They knew they would be the first to build it. And also to ensure that they were first to build it, they're not telling anyone who they're working with quite yet. They will tell people later, but right now, it's a secret. Uh, but you can look at the semantics, you can look at the firmware, you can look at uh, the layout, all of those things. This is the Librem 15, uh, the larger cousin to this laptop. Um, collectively, between those two campaigns, they raised over a million dollars on crowd supply. Uh, they're shipping now, both of them. And uh, it's really designed to be free and open source from the software level. The hardware is not at all. Right? It's built from a software reference design, not a known uh, case that they modded. Um, but they tried really hard to, to source everything so that it could only it, should, it needed only run uh, open, free and open source software. And they succeeded up until a certain point. And if anybody's familiar with the Intel management engine and what that means and how that's irreplaceable, um, it's a whole separate talk almost, but they couldn't replace that part and, and they're petitioning Intel to actually free that up. Uh, but that's an interesting notion, right? Because it is the most fundamental thing on the, on the computer. It controls everything else and it can do anything, right? Even while your computer is ostensibly asleep. Uh, so it, brings up this question of, does it matter if you have free and open source software on everything except for the most important thing, which is just this big compared to this universe of software, right? If, if trust is the issue. This, on the other hand, is the Novena laptop. Uh, it, it opens like a saw, uh, kind of backwards, right? So you, when, it, and when it opens, you can see the guts, and it's meant to be tinkered with, it's meant to be um, Hacked on. It's really a hardware engineer's toolkit. It has an FPGA on board with a, as a, a coprocessor. It's ARM based. It's one of the few laptops where you actually don't have to sign an NDA to see all the chips. Um, it doesn't run any blobs uh, uh, in there. You could you could run some blobs if you want hardware acceleration on certain things, but you don't have to. Um, this is uh, a, a precursor to this guy. It was a. The Novena was used as a, as a prototyping platform for this piece of hardware, which is not a laptop at all, but rather a, a cryptographic hardware security module. And this is the sort of thing that would be locked away in a vault uh, off of a network next to a server storing all of its keys. Right? And this is what banks would use. This is, what, this is the most secure type of, of computing um, environment would use this, this thing. And it's the first and only open source version. So you, it, it's ironic in some ways that it's taken this long to get a completely trustworthy uh, device for handling the most secret things in the world, these cryptographic keys for banks and other institutions. What does the panic button do? Sorry? What does the panic button do? Yeah, don't push that. <laughs> <laughs> it probably erases everything. Uh, and you're vote. It's not done uh, not, I, I, Probably, is, okay, it's okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. This is the alpha board. It was given out to a, about a dozen people in Berlin uh, um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and this, is a, this is a modest say. This is not a consumer product, obviously. Right? This is, yeah, they were selling to the, the 12 people in the world who know how to use it and are developers. And this is just, they use crowd supplies as a way of, of gathering those funds and, and getting with the press. Um, <clears throat> this laptop, or this, this ecosystem, I should say, is based on this card in the lower uh, left there. If, if you had a laptop in the 90s, you'll recognize that as a PCMCA card. Uh, and it's reusing those same components, the connectors, the, the enclosures, because those are mass produced, right? There's still companies in China making those things for legacy satellite computers or, or something. Um, and so a, a clever guy out of the UK decided to use that form factor, use those connectors, get rid of tons of tooling because of that, um, and put an entire computer into that. Um, and he's doing this uh, uh, using only free and open source software compatible parts, so there's no management engine, for example. 
but the console has fairly low power, right? It's a 1.2 gigahertz, I think it's a dual, dual core. Uh, what's that? Quad? <coughs> Maybe, yeah. Uh, quad core 32 bit machine, that's an all winner A20. Um, the, the disk uh, drive looking thing on, on the left, made of wood, is the desktop enclosure. So if you use your dock essentially, out of the back you'd see like uh, HDMI ports and USB ports and a, a power hub. Um, you just hook that up to your monitor and keyboard and your know, computer. Or you can take that same card and slot it into your laptop, your 3D printed laptop. Right? And this is entirely 3D printed. Obviously, the keyboard and, and the trackpad aren't, and neither is the, the screen itself, but everything else is. Uh, and you can replace any part. So if you keep dropping your laptop on this corner and it totally breaks, you just 3D print out your parts, provide it from something you have, and replace that. Similarly, if you want to upgrade the processor, you just put in a different card. Right? So I know a 64 bit version is on its way probably not for another year or so. Um, that's a $65 card right now. And this is funding right now. This hasn't launched yet, but will soon. Uh, and I should say that, that you know, the, the, the piece of open source here, this is trying to be as open as possible. So there's really nothing that's hidden. All the supply chain is there. Um, all the documentation, no MDAs, nothing like that. This is about to launch. This is called Warwell. Uh, and this is interesting because it's using open source not because it's expecting people to, to do revisions on it, but because it's trying to build up as much trust as it can uh, to prove that it is, in fact, the most secure, you know, physically secure computer that you can get. Right? This is physically secure. Not only does it look like a UFO and scare people away, but uh, inside that glass enclosure, you have this active mesh um, on a very brittle polymer with very thin gold traces that, encumber, that encompasses the entire motherboard. If that mesh is tampered with at all and there are specifications on how, what that means, so if certain drill bit sizes, which you can't buy anymore, I think, uh, penetrate, it'll break one of, those, one of those gold traces, that will be detected right away, and the private key that keeps everything encrypted automatically on the internal drive will be burned. Right? So you have to start from scratch, all your data is lost. Uh, this is really meant um, you know, all the security flaws that, that, that are inherent in the software are still there, of course. This is the hardware protection, right? So there's a, a specialized TPM uh, security module on there. Um, and there's this key on the right here is a Bluetooth, low energy, and NFC combo. So you actually have to be near the computer for it to boot up or even get power. Um, if you walk away, it'll lock down for a bit. If it's moved at all or jostled while you're away, it shuts down. And then, of course, it has a battery in the size, even if it's unplugged and it's tampered with, uh, it fries itself. I'm trying to convince them to put in a little smoke module so actual smoke comes out. <laughs> um, so like I said, that's a very, uh, they're using open source in a very different way there. Uh, this was purely to build up trust. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about this is that I mean, we seem to be painting ourselves into a corner of, of products that have very specific values, and that you know, how big of a market could there actually be for that? And the answer is that's actually where we make most, most of our money, right? Uh, things like this. Um, and when you add these things up, people really respond to it really well. Uh, our success rate for campaigns is 58%, which is about uh, over twice that of our competitors. Uh, so campaigns getting funded. When they do get funded, they're raising about three times more than anyone else, about $63,000. And so far, all of our projects have delivered. Right? So no one has actually raised money from us and then not delivered the project that they had promised to their backers. Of course, some are running late. That's expected. Um, we try to mitigate for that. Uh, the point is, though, that, that values-driven product development is a profitable business. And uh, uh, we're, we're, we're slowly winning the battle and convincing people that that's the case. You know, I just convinced an Italian company, for example, or a sorry, Swiss company the other day, um, to completely open source their entire product. And after they thought about it for a little bit, they're like, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do it. So we'll be launching that sometime in the fall. Um, that's it. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, I know we're very short on time, uh, so I don't want to keep anybody too long. But um, any questions right now? And of course, keep up, keep in touch with us on, on our newsletter and on the website. So you're local? Yeah. So we're, we're based here in Portland, uh, just across the river.
been around for three and a half years. Cool. I know it's late. Let's get out of here. Thank you very much. <laughs>